on. We've got a nice size audience already in line. So I think we'll get started right away. Um, I, I welcome to today's program, Advocating for Survivors of Domestic Abuse and Parenting Time and Responsibility Disputes. For those of you who are not familiar with Shalva, our mission is to support Jewish women experiencing and healing from domestic abuse through counseling, supportive services, and community education. Um, we are located in the um, Chicagoland area, and I will put our website in the, in the chat as, well, as soon as Lundy starts speaking. Uh, we will be using mostly the Q&A um, function, please, um, chat. Well, I'll be using a little bit for links and things, but if you could put any questions you have for Lundy in the Q&A, um, it's going to be the way those, that's where we're going to go to get questions at the end. So um, before I introduce our speaker, one other thing, um, we are going to post our survey before the Q&A. So just be warned that that's going to come because we'd really like to hear back from you. Um, so before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to do a quick poll here to find out what, kind of where everybody's coming from and what their background is. Um, you know, today is, a le is technically a legal, continuing legal education program, but we recognize that quite a few people um, are not attorneys that are attending today. So just wanna get a sense of who's out there. So I'm gonna launch this poll. And um, if you could quickly do an, an answer, or let us know. Um, looks like a lot of attorneys, no judges, a few caring humans, we like that. Okay, it seems like we're settled out. So um, over half, about 60% attorneys and uh, another 30% uh, DV advocates, and then some child evaluators, uh, GALs, mediators, and a few people just watching because they care. So we're gonna go ahead and close that. Thank you very much. That gives us a good idea of, of who we've got in here today. So um, I am pleased to welcome back Lundy Bancroft to Shalva. His program last October for Domestic Violence Awareness Month um, has over 2,700 views on our YouTube channel. Um, one of the comments in that YouTube is, have him back, I wanna hear more. So here we are, we listened. Lundy has over 30 years experience specializing in interventions for abusive men and their families. He's authored six books, including the world bestseller on domestic violence, Why Does He Do That? And the prize winning professional book, The Better is Parent, which we do use in our Shaba office. Uh, Lundy is a former training director of Emerge, the US's first counseling program for women, for men who batter, and has been involved in over 2000 cases as a counselor and clinical supervisor. He also serves extensively as a custody evaluator, a child abuse investigator, and an expert witness. So with that, um, I am going to turn it over to Lundy. Great, thanks so much. And, uh, and, and welcome everybody. We're talking about a difficult topic today, which is what goes on for an abused woman after she leaves the abuser, if, if the abuser is the children's father, her children's father. And research tells us that, that almost two thirds of the time, over 60% of the time, that where, where there are children present, the perpetrator is their father. The remaining cases, he's a stepfather or he's a live-in boyfriend of mom that doesn't have, you know, doesn't have parental rights with respect to the kids. But the, you know, a substantial majority of the time, the abuser is someone with parental rights. And that means that when the woman makes attempts to leave him or when she leaves him, he's gonna start playing the family court card. Uh, that wasn't always the case when I came into the field. The, the abusers hadn't really discovered yet back in the 80s and early 90s, how much success they could have in the family court. In fact, I think they assumed they would not do well there, uh, which is what most of the society assumes is that an abuser would not do well in family court. But in the, the truth is they were actually already starting to win by the late 80s. They, that's what the research shows. They just didn't know it yet. 
but in the in the 90s and now into the 2000 in the 1990s and now into the first two decades of the 2000s abusers have become well aware that the family court is a favorable atmosphere to them and they're going there now as a matter of routine to demand custody to demand if they can't win primary custody to demand at least 50 50 custody and the the atmosphere there in our times is not a good one for abused women. There's tremendous reluctance on the part of the family court system. I'm not talking about every individual in it, but I'm talking about the family court system as a system. Tremendous reluctance to take domestic violence seriously, to read the literature on domestic violence, to understand why we're so concerned for children uh, having unsupervised contact with a domestic violence perpetrator. Uh, to really understand anything about children's healing processes post-separation when they've been living with a man who abuses their mother. And the, there's a general atmosphere now of just impatience and derision towards the mother. Like she shouldn't be worried. She's overreacting. She's being hysterical. Uh, court personnel so, say things to her like, oh, well, you're just worried that he's gonna do the kinds of things to the children that he did to you. We'll come back and talk about that, but statistically speaking, she has good reason to believe that he's going to do to the children what he's done to her, because statistics show that that's has a very, very high rate of accuracy in domestic violence cases. So there's a lot of need in our time for people who can help the abused woman, both lawyers and not lawyer, non-lawyers, to help her navigate the family court system, to support her emotionally through it, to help her strategize, and to take her really seriously about why she's concerned for her children. Because any woman who's come out of domestic violence has really good reason to worry about her children. And I want to emphasize that point up front, because uh, many people, whether friends or relatives or people in the family law system, will say to her, well, does he abuse the children? And she'll say, well, no, there's not really a history of him abusing the children directly. And then people will jump from that to say, oh, well then why you shouldn't be worried about them. And there are all kinds of reasons why a domestic violence perpetrator is bad news for children post-separation that don't have to do with him abusing them. In fact, I'll tell you right now that answer number one, and this is again, well supported in the research is that his, the number one post-separation risk to children from domestic violence perpetrators is that he will go all out to destroy those children's relationship with, with their mother. And he will have some considerable success at damaging the, those relationships and sometimes at wrecking them. And the court is, in our times, actually completely focused on the opposite. They're focused on the notion that the mother is alleging domestic violence in order to destroy children's relationship with their father. And based on that assumption are refusing to investigate cases carefully and are completely ignoring the much far more widespread problem, which is the domestic violence perpetrator doing what he's accusing mom of doing and really driving children against her. So uh, we need people who can really understand what mom is up against and understand she has really good reason to worry about how her kids are going to do and how her relationship with those kids are going to do are, is how that is, and those are almost the same question because the research tells us that particularly for kids who've witnessed domestic violence the quality of the relationship with their mother is the best predictor of how they're going to do long term so if the abuser is out to damage their relationship with their mother that in itself is a sign of huge psychological risk to those children because that's one of the greatest harms he can do to those children is to damage their relationship with their mom. So I'm going to be talking some to just give you a picture of what's going on in the family courts right now, but I'm going to make that pretty quick so that we can have as much of the time as possible for focusing on concretely what advocates, lawyers, and other people can do to, to make a difference to the abused woman. But Okay, so at, at this point in history, we're, we're generally saying as a society that a woman should feel free to leave a man who abuses her, that we, even, we encourage her to consider that as an option. Uh, if there is child protection involved with her family prior to the breakup, 
they're going to be demanding typically that she leave him. They're going to be saying that she must leave him, that she sh that that's the correct parenting response. When she gets to the family law system, unfortunately, she's going to get the opposite reaction, believe it or not. So child protection is going to be saying, you should be protecting these children from this man, and you're a bad parent if you don't. And then when she gets in the family law system, the family law system is going to say you should not be attempting to protect your children from this man. You're a bad parent if you do try to protect them from him. And I'm not exaggerating. The, I, I was a co-author of a play about this issue called Failure, uh, called Forbidden to Protect, because the family court is now accusing mothers of what's called parental alienation because of entirely appropriate post-separation efforts to protect her children from a known domestic violence perpetrator. He's known to her. So, okay, so what should be happening? What, what's the society imagining is happening when she leaves an abuser? That she's safe and that the children are now safe. Certainly child protection completely assumes that by leaving the abuser, she's increased her children's safety. Uh, that they're all gonna get a chance to heal from these years of abuse and they'll be moving into a different kind of future. In practice, that's not really it. In practice, the family court typically berates the mother. This has become much more the rule in our times. I'm not exaggerating. This has become more the rule in our times than the exception, is that the family court berates mom for insisting that her children are not safe with the father. And they don't make any serious effort to actually investigate the history of domestic violence. Typically, they're going to reject her allegations on the basis of mythology, like, oh, well, he wouldn't be a domestic violence perpetrator because of this and this and this that is completely counter to the actual facts of domestic violence and how it works. But also, even if even if the facts are so overwhelming that that the history of domestic violence is inescapable, then the court is going to tend to say, well, but that that's, you know, you're, you've split up now. So his that, that domestic violence perpetrator is not really an issue. And you contributed to it because you tended to really push his buttons and set him off. And so we're just not gonna take that seriously and we're not gonna actually do anything about what's the, what are the typical parenting issues that men who batter exhibit both pre and post separation. The primary concern being how he's gonna use the children as weapons against the mother. So it's a key thing. Folks who already heard me will be familiar with this next point that I'm going to make, but for those of you who haven't heard me before, a key point to understand about the domestic violence perpetrator is that uh, he believes that his behavior is entirely the woman's fault, that he's not responsible for his abusive actions, that she caused him to do these things, and that she is being fundamentally mean and unfair to him because she stands up to him, because she doesn't always wait on him hand and foot, because she has called the police on him times when he's been violent and there's all kinds of entirely appropriate behaviors on her part, he considers as wrongs against him. And he considers that a wrong against him that this relationship has ended. Uh, regardless of who left it, by the way, even if he's the one that left the relationship, he's, it's, still, it's still wrong that this relationship is over because she should have she should have done all the things he wanted her to do while they were together and then they wouldn't have to split up. If she's the one who's ended the relationship, which is true most of the time in a domestic violence case, then he's furious that she's ending him, that she's left him. She had no right to do that. This is truly the abuser mentality. She had no right to do that. And the, that, she's, that, she's, uh, that she really owes him all kinds of things. And so his attitude post-separation is that he's gonna now devote the, the next decade or two of his life to getting revenge on her for having left him. But now that they're not together, he doesn't have a lot of day-to-day -day access to her. So how can he get that revenge? Well, he can try to destroy her financially, and many abusers try to do that, and also try to destroy her reputation. He can stalk her, and a fair number of abusers do that, but that has some more serious potential legal consequences. It's hard to prosecute, but it does have some more potential legal consequences. And then the third avenue that's open to him is the children, and the children are an easy vehicle for him. So the temptation is just, so the temptation there is just overwhelming. And more and more abusers actually in our time are learning how to use the children as weapons post-separation and 
commit what we what, what those of us in the field call domestic violence by proxy, meaning he's going to continue the abuse uh, you, by uh, hurting her, controlling her, bullying her, damaging her life through the children, which of course is also going to damage the children's lives. Uh, Family courts are generally going to require the children to be with their father much more than is actually good for children when their father is a domestic violence perpetrator. Uh, they're not going to be willing to take any significant steps to reduce the financial burden on the mother, even though the reason she's in this litigation is because of his domestic violence perpetration. For example, he's very often going to use repeated frivolous court dates as a way to destroy her financially. And even though the court knows that he's or she's at least telling the court that he's got a history of perpetrating domestic violence, they're not going to say that that makes any difference in how they're going to handle his giving him permission to keep uh, using repeated court dates as, as a way to control and damage her. The children in this picture tend to show, start to show signs of distress. The research shows that the children tend to actually do quite well until they start to have extensive visitation with their battering dads. So in other words, they do tend to heal post-separation if they're not spending a lot of time alone with him, particularly a lot of unsupervised time with him. But once they start to spend a bunch of time with him, they start to deteriorate. Unfortunately, the family court's response to this is to say, mom is the problem. The reason they're deteriorating is because of mom's resentment towards dad. And, if, and, the, and the ways that she's exposing children towards her resentment towards dad, so that if she would stop exposing children towards uh, those feelings, the children would be doing fine with their visitation with him because he's a lovely man. And so court orders, for example, in our time are more and more focused on what to require mom to do, not what to require the abuser to do. And they're more and more saying, for example, this is now starting to be written into court orders. I've seen it myself that mom is to tell the children that she's in favor of them going to their fathers, even if they don't wanna go. So if, if the children don't wanna go, the mom is now being required by the judge to say, well, I think these visits are good for you. I really think you should go with your father. And if children are saying, but he's intimidating, he's a bullying, he talks trash constantly about you, he's mean to us verbally, he's not usually physically hitting them, but he's mean to us verbally, she's supposed to say, well, no, I really think this is good for you. She's being ordered by the court to betray her children emotionally and say, no, I really think it's good for you to go. So uh, the, the actual source of the children's distress is being completely ignored and it's very unusual, I'd almost unheard of. It would be very hard for me to even think of examples from the past 20 years of my involvement in family courts where his visitation was made less because of the children deteriorating from visitation with him. Now, this is an interesting point, that visitation overwhelmingly with a domestic violence perpetrator and his kids either stays at the same amount that it is now, or it gets more, it never gets less. Now, sometimes it's very restricted from the beginning, but from there, it's going to get more or stay the same. So it doesn't matter what he does, what his behavior is. It doesn't matter if the children are deteriorating his time is not going to get less. So there's no serious effort there to address the causes of his distress. Uh, I'm sorry, of the children's distress. A few examples of the kinds of things that abusers are doing post-separation that are causing their children's deterioration. One of the things is obviously turning children against their mother. That's the number one thing he wants to do. But there are more. He typically starts to lie to children about the history of, the, of his abuse towards mom, including incidents that the children witnessed themselves, he's now gonna rewrite for them. And that's gonna to start to cause psychological tension and difficulty inside them. He tends to create divisions between his children. He's a, just a divide and conquer kind of mentality. That's a lot what the domestic violence perpetrator is like. And so he plays favorites and he's nastier to kids who side, who are who he perceives as being in any way on mom's side and much, more generous and give much more, a lot more privileges to kids who he perceives as being on his side. So that causes tensions between the kids and also within the kids. He tends to be a really selfish and self-centered and irresponsible parent because that's in the nature of a domestic violence perpetrator. 
is that his attitude towards family is that everything should be done for him. So putting those kids in really extensive time alone in his care is not a good idea when you've got a parent who not only hates their mother and is violent towards her and blames her for everything, but also believes that children's job is to make his life go well. It's not his job to make his children's life go well. He's a terrible role model. And we've got such a huge collection of research showing that the sons in particular of batterers are far, at least twice as likely, it's a huge jump, at least twice as likely as other boys to grow up to become batterers themselves. That's a huge negative impact that he has that's well established in the research. Um, he's, and, the, and the research shows, by the way, it, this is an interesting research finding that the research shows that the abuser's modeling of abusiveness is the main reason why his boys become abusers, not because of the trauma or other damage that he's doing, which is causing a lot of other problems, but what's really causing them to become abusers is his direct role modeling. And yet I have never once, you know, I've been involved in you know, 80 or 100 family law cases in a number, wearing a number of different hats. I've never once seen a case where the family court in any way weighed whether the abuser's impact as a role model in decisions that it made about how much time a domestic violence perpetrator should spend with his children. Now that is a bizarre and extreme missing piece. And I would really like to see attorneys start raising this much more in hearings, bringing the research showing that the sons of batterers tend to become batterers themselves and saying that the, his impact as a role model should be one of the factors that's taken into account and in how much unsupervised time he's getting with these kids. And I know that in the early stages, that would be what's called a novel argument because that's not an argument that's being made, but that's how an argument becomes acceptable is through some period of years when it's not very acceptable and being made as a novel argument, but then does start to become familiar to judges. And this is how the abuser certainly played this card, because when the abusers first started raising parental alienation, nobody knew what parental alienation was, and they didn't really get them anywhere. But within a few years, judges were starting to say, oh, parental alienation, oh yeah, I've heard about that, let's talk about that. And suddenly the abusers were getting huge mileage out of saying that the reason that their kids hated them was not because he'd been abusing their mother, but because their mother had been trying to alienate him from the children. Uh, children tend to show symptoms of being re-traumatized. Why? Be well, from their visits with the abuser. Why? Because they're carrying a lot of trauma, as a mountain of research studies tell us, from having witnessed his violence while the family was together. Not just his violence, his threats, his degradation towards mom, his sexual assaults towards mom, all this stuff is in the literature. So being with him tends to be triggering for them, to be re-traumatizing for them, but is never considered as a factor. Or, uh, I shouldn't say never, because that is actually sometimes considered as a factor, but very rarely considered as a factor in what kind of time they should have with him. So, then he's also able to use their wounds to his advantage because their, their desperate need for safety, their wounds from what he's done in the past, I mean, their desperate need for safety, their desperate need for some kind of rec reconciliation and closeness to him since they weren't getting to have that during those years when he was being so awful to their mother, uh, just their need for his attention in general because the abuser it tends to be such a neglectful, inattentive parent. So all these needs that he has, that the children have because of things that he has done, he now uses to his advantage. He's now attentive to his children. He's now present for them. He now does things with them. And that's connecting with them right where they're most wounded. And so this is a period when they're really likely to say, for example, to a custody evaluator, oh yeah, we love dad, dad's completely changed. We wanna live with dad. And if you don't look at how this actually has to do with the way that he's manipulating their wounds, you're gonna miss a huge, huge dynamic. So uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna go over this next set of slides in any kind of detail. The, 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 I'm just gonna, well, actually, let's just flip through them so you can just look at them quickly if you want. 
but Children are going to go through a very powerful set of mixed feelings. They're not going to like cheer, you know, congratulate mom for having left dad. It's going to be much, much more complicated than that. And they're going to have all these post-trauma symptoms, emotional behavior, eruptions, behavioral eruptions. The abuser has conditioned the children not to respect the mom's authority. That's inherent in domestic violence. He doesn't even have to have done it on purpose. He's conditioned them not to respect her authority just because of the way they see him treat her. So the children are gonna be very, very hard to manage. He then, that's another thing he can then use to his advantage. He can then say to the family court, oh, well, she's having trouble managing the children's behavior and I'm not having any trouble managing their behavior. Yeah, right. First of all, because he has almost no rules for them because he's such an irresponsible parent. And secondly, because his kids are afraid of him. So, and then the irony is that when children are doing quite well, then that's actually when they're likely to be strong enough to say, actually, we don't want to see dad. And then that's going to be pathologized by the court. The court's going to consider that a symptom of paternal, uh, of parental alienation by mom. Now, notice here, there's a fun fundamental hypocrisy in how the court is operating, because when children want to see their battering dad, the court is saying, well, they want to see him. So yeah, there's all these reasons to be, the, you can give me all these reasons to be concerned about the risks to them physically, sexually, psychologically from their time with him, but they're saying they want to see him. So when they, when they do want to see their battering dad, that's carrying a lot of weight. When they don't want to see their battering dad, that carries no weight at all. You don't hear the family court saying, well, they don't want to see him. You hear a family court saying, hmm, Mom's a parental alienator. And you hear kids really need their father, regardless. And of course, they do need their non-battered fathers. But it's like, no, they, they, you know, they, really, they really need them, et cetera. And so, so actually, signs of kids healing and moving forward, times of kids being, I mean, signs, sorry, of kids healing and moving forward, signs of them doing well are going to be pathologized and once again used against the mother. Okay, so, and, and uh, the, these are just an, another set of, of challenges that the mother has that are gonna tend to make it look like things are not going as well as at, at, at her house, but I don't have time to go into these in detail. A lot of these slides are from more like a three hour presentation than a one hour presentation. They'll, they'll be there, you'll have them as reference points. What I want to zero in on is, you know, what can advocates and lawyers do? So first of all, normalize for mom that, that, that this is what goes on when kids are in unsupervised contact with an abuser, that their, their, their trauma from the past is being uh, triggered. He's continuing to undermine her parenting in various ways. She's not a terrible parent. She's not a sick person. Her kids aren't sick people. The, the abuser is the problem and the system is the problem. So just help her understand that, that, this, is, that, that this is what pra practically all abused women are reporting about what happens at this stage in life. Uh, encourage her to make her relationships with her children her top priority. He's going to be out to continue for as long, you know, as long as he lives to damage her relationship with those kids. And so she's going to have to fight extra hard for her, for the strength of those relationships to, to get better and better at resolving conflicts with them, to, to really spend good time with them and to actually have fun with them, uh, to be supportive of them towards challenges they face in their lives. The, she, she really needs to do an exceptional job. That's not fair. She shouldn't have to do an exceptional job, but she's going to have to because of his irresponsibility and because of the court's irresponsibility. Uh, she can really use help in, uh, to guide her in ways to respond to her children's distress. So help her think through what she might say when they're going through different things, how she should respond to their crying, uh, which I wrote about in, in my book, When Dad Hurts Mom, a whole set of suggestions about how to help with ki what kids are going through emotionally and specifically how to respond to their complaints about dad. 
And the court may tell her that she should be responding to their complaints about dad by just saying, oh, dad loves you. That's not good advice. Kids desperately need validation from their mother when dad's abusive. Uh, so she needs to say to them, yeah, that's really not okay. And yes, I can really understand why you're upset. She doesn't need to say, yeah, he's a jerk. Yeah, he's a selfish, you know what? Yeah, he's a batterer. The, the labeling him doesn't help the kids, but the, but the naming of the behavior is wrong. The kids really, really need to hear. They need that emotionally and they need that developmentally. So she needs to be able to say to them, yeah, that's not okay what he's doing and you have good reason to be upset about it. And she needs to try to be able to accept the whole range of feelings that they're gonna have towards their dad. They're gonna love him and they're gonna hate him. And that's very, very complex, but that's how it plays out when your dad has a long history of abusing your mom, whether, whether he abuses you or not, is that you love him and you hate him. And that's very, it's a very complex set of emotions. And it's very hard for kids to go anywhere where people have some space for that, for that we hate him side of those emotions, but they need space for both of those. Uh, I think I've said enough about this stuff. I, I, I guess what, what, I'm, what I'm getting at in, 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 on this slide is that it's very easy, particularly because of how much her authority has been undermined and continues to be undermined by the abuser, for life and the family to all just become about trying to reestablish some maternal authority, which she does need to try to do, and kind of manage her children's behavior and manage their fights with each other because the abuser is sowing all these divisions. And you know she's forced to put some of her energy into that, but we want to help her make sure that that's not what day-to-day -day life becomes, to the extent that she can that she can fight against that. And she can't change what he does, but that she can have some at least impact on what goes on in her home by remembering to laugh with kids, by remembering to sit down and play a board game with them and watch your movie with them, and not not let life become about the, the, all these tensions that the abuser is working so hard to create. Uh, I'm gonna go on to legal stuff. I, I think they, they, these are just sort of more points I'm making about that are more for advocates. Oh, I, I guess we're about 50-50 advocates and legal people today, but the, the abuser creates a lot of difficulties in relationships between siblings. So anything we can do to help mom help kids work out their own difficulties, the, that's going to be a real gift to those kids. And I recommend very highly the book by Adele Faber and Elaine Maslish called Siblings Without Rivalry. And you don't even really need to remember the author's name because you can just find it under the title, Siblings Without Rivalry. A very short book too. The, the, you know, parenting books tend to be really long, which is like, well, but wait a minute, you're writing this book for parents. <laughs> they can't read a long book. Who are you kidding? Particularly parents of young children. So one thing that Faber and Maslish did that was so good was they wrote short books. Now, you may have heard of their other, their other well-known book, which is called How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk, which is another absolutely terrific book. Now, I recommend that to all parents, but I particularly recommend that book to abuse women. Uh, and so both of the Faber and Maslow's books are just terrific. How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk and Siblings Without Rivalry. Um, the concept of setting family standards, the, what I mean by that is just that I've seen moms, be very, certain moms be very successful. In fact, I learned it from them. They didn't learn it from me. I've seen certain abused moms be very successful at getting children to take pride in the fact that this is a family where people treat each other well. And that's how she has managed to get them to not bring the stuff from the abuser's home into her home, is by saying, no, in this family, we're good to each other. In this family, we, li we listen to each other. In this family, we don't compete. Instead, we celebrate each other's successes. Because when you get competitive, you start to Put each other's successes down. No, we're not going to put each other's successes down. We're going to celebrate each other's successes in this family. We're going to take each other's uh, sadnesses and upsets seriously instead of trivializing or rejecting each other's. Like we're, we have each other's backs in this family. 
And I've seen moms who've succeeded in creating this kind of family ethic about that. It doesn't have go, it doesn't happen quickly, it doesn't happen easily, but I've seen them over time start to, to, to get to a point where the children start to feel proud of being that kind of family. And then what's going on at the abuser's house starts to look way, way off. And that's what we want. We want them to be able to start to perceive how far off things are at the abuser's home. So. Uh, there's tons of things to say here, but I'm gonna, I wanna go to the legal stuff in the interest of time. So, uh, this, so first of all, uh, she needs an attorney who's sympathetic and who's a good listener and who gets why she's worried about her children being in an extensive program of unsupervised contact with the abuser. And uh, people will tend to point her towards maybe the toughest attorney or the attorney that has the best reputation as a divorce attorney. And that's not what she needs. That's not actually what's gonna help her case go well. She does need an attorney with some spine. That is important. She does not need a bulldog attorney. A lot of times the abuser has a bulldog attorney. So, so people think, oh, so now we've got to get a bulldog attorney for her. The same thing that works for him is not going to work for her. And I find the bulldog, I've been involved in a couple of cases where the woman had the bulldog attorney and it actually didn't help her case go particularly well. There's just so much gender bias in the courts that having a, that, that a bulldog working for the batterer will, will in many ways succeed in furthering his interests and that same style with the woman will not. The style of attorney that the abused woman needs is an attorney who comes off very peaceful, seeming very conciliatory, very willing to work things out, is that way in those in, in the interactions with the other attorney, is in that way in, in interactions in the courtroom, but who actually is much tougher than he or she looks, who's just, oh yeah, well, I'm polite, let's all get along, let's all work things out. But then totally has the client's back. And this one I've seen uh, work in court. I've seen, you know, four, five, six different attorneys who had this style where they were maybe on a hidden level of bulldog, but they certainly didn't come off that way. That wasn't how they looked to judges. That wasn't how they looked to the other attorney, but they did not sell their clients out. They did not push their clients to sign agreements that the client should not be signing. They weren't always trying to, oh, let's make peace. Let's make peace. Let's make peace. You want to come off as someone who's making peace, but you don't in reality want to be pushing your client to make peace about everything. You give to an abuser, they just take more and more and more. And this is one of the things that the misconceptions that some people have from other divorces that, that you can't apply to a domestic violence divorce. There's, and there's so many dynamics where that's true. In a typical divorce, even a typically fairly tense divorce with a lot of bad feeling, you make some concessions to the other side, it tends to reduce the tension level and you're gonna get some, some concessions back. That doesn't happen when you're divorcing the domestic abuser. And so, so many people wanna apply that thinking to the domestic abuser, say, oh, give to him and, and then things will settle down and you get things back. No, she won't, <laughs> no, she won't. She, she, uh, she should only give to him things that she can live with giving to him because nothing is gonna come in return for her having given on those things. Uh, mediation is really worth trying. And the, in principle, those in the domestic violence field, we discourage mediation, but, but in this case, it really makes sense because litigation in our times is not going well for abused women. So it, it makes sense for her to try to mediate. If she doesn't feel, if, if it's not safe for her or doesn't feel safe to her to, to be around the abuser, then we need to do what's called shuttle diplomacy, where you need to find a mediator who's willing to go back and forth, meeting with her, meeting with him, meeting with her, meeting with him, and who doesn't insist on meeting with them all together. And uh, any mediated agreement needs to go to the court and be signed off on by a judge to make it an order of the court because abusers do not feel obligated to follow their own agreements, even agreements that they've sworn to up and down, they feel like they have every right a year from now to say, oh, but I don't like that agreement's not fair. I, I, it wasn't fair. And uh, then the last thing I'll say about mediation is it really needs to be what we call closed mediation, which means if no agreement is reached, the mediator reports nothing to the court. The mediator should never, in a domestic violence case, should never report anything to the court other than what agreement was reached or that no agreement was reached. 
A mediator, in other words, should never be in a position of being allowed to report to the court how the mediator, how the mediation went. Because an abused woman who knows that the mediator is going to be reporting to the court how the mediation went starts to give in to all kinds of things she doesn't want to give in to because she doesn't want to have the mediator telling the judge that she was the one blocking a good outcome. And this happens. This, ha this happens to abused women all the time where she's trying to hold the line on things that absolutely are, are fair and absolutely are essential to her children. And then the mediator reports to the court, well, mom, you know, dad has given in on various unreasonable things that he was demanding, but mom really hasn't come very far. Mom is really the block to reaching an agreement here. And that's disastrous. So we, the concept of closed mediation means there will be no report to the court by the mediator. That's the only way mediation should take place in a domestic violence case. Uh, I don't encourage the bringing in of guardians ad litem and parent coordinators and special masters and other court appointees if you can avoid it. It's much better to have the decisions made in hearings. The, the guardians ad litem are part of a whole culture. I used to be a guardian ad litem. I'm very aware of the culture. Parent coordinators are part of that whole culture that's not responding well to domestic violence cases. Now, there may be, you may, there may be GALs in the audience today who are responding well to domestic violence. I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm just saying the, that as a field, and I, you know, I used to belong to the Massachusetts Association of Guardians of Litem. I used to belong to the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts back when I was a GAL. As a field, it is not responding well to domestic violence cases. It is not properly protecting children from their exposure post-separation to domestic batterers. And so you don't want a GAL unless you know exactly who the person is. And unless you know, not just that they're a pleasant and likable person, but you have some case experience of how they have handled other domestic violence cases in the past. There's gonna be a real temptation on the woman's part to give away the store financially in order to keep custody. Discourage her from doing this. I totally sympathize. In her position, I would wanna do the same thing. Who cares about money? I want my kids. The problem is the financial agreements, except for child support cannot be revisited, but custody can always be revisited. And what he does is wait a year, two years, three years, four years, and then he comes back fighting her for custody also, in addition to having taken all the money. Only now she can't really fight him for custody because he's got all the money. So it's really important. That's, that's the crucial reason why not to give away the store in order to keep custody is then later he decides to fight you for custody. You got no resources to fight him. The, the abused woman should consider going pro se if she can't find an attorney that she can afford or she can't find an attorney that she feels is taking her really seriously. It's hard for her to represent herself and some women just don't have the character for it. And I respect that. Some women say, I couldn't do that. I would just be breaking into tears in court or I would just be trembling in court. And if she says she can't do it, then I respect that she can't do it. But I want her to consider that as an option, at least to at least reflect on it because it's very hard for abused women to afford attorneys. And, but even more than that, it's very hard for them to find attorneys who take her concerns about her children seriously and who are willing to fight for them, who aren't too sort of scared of the judge and scared of the batterer's attorney, the abuser's attorney, and are willing to fight. And so I see a fair number of cases where things go better if the woman represents herself. Of course, if she has a strong, caring, uh, courageous, knowledgeable attorney, that's going to be much better than being pro se. But being pro se is often better than having an attorney who's really not getting it and who's not willing to fight for her. Uh, many, many cases will involve psych testing. That's completely irresponsible on the court's part. There's no science to it. That's another long discussion that I take audiences through to actually look at the complete lack of scientific underpinning to the use of psychological testing in child custody. It's, a, it's a, just an open fraud. But the, if psychological testing does happen, we have to be able to put, and many custody evaluators will insist on there also being a psych evaluator. We've got to be prepared to put psych evaluators on the stand, and we've got to be prepared to question them very pointedly about what the research shows that backs up or doesn't back up what they're saying. They'll say, for example, people with such and such a profile tend to be such and such a way. It's a very common comment that they'll make about mom's psych testing for things where people with that profile about 70%
tend to be the way that the psych evaluator is describing. He or she didn't say that in the psych eval, but those are the actual facts when you look at what are called the validity scales for these psych tests, is that typically their accuracy is gonna be around 60 or 70, sometimes 80%. So what a psych evaluator says, the person is, is, this, is described as being this way or likely to be this way, they're gonna be wrong about one time out of three. But, so those are the kinds of questions you have to ask them on the stand. I, I'll give you a, a, a resource on a couple of minutes, Jay, this Jay Ziskin book that people really need to go to for dealing with you, often the custody evaluator, but certainly the psych evaluator, which is called coping with psychiatric and psychological testimony. Uh, I've already talked about the main thing I wanna say about strategy for hearings, which is you try to come off very polite, you try to come off very willing to negotiate and work things out, but you fight hard for your client. At the same time, we want to encourage the woman not to feel that her entire future rises and falls with what the court does, because the court could make really good decisions and the abuser will still find ways to make their lives miserable. And sometimes the court makes pretty bad decisions and the mom still finds ways to save her relationships with her kids. So, so yes, the court ruling makes a big difference in their future, but it is not the complete be all and end all of her future. And it's I want her to have some sense of agency and say, no, no matter what happens, your relationship with your kids is going to matter. And, and, and there are some things that you can do to make that go well. Uh, and I'm going to give some final thoughts that we can have the, the rest of the time for questions, legal or not. Uh, be patient with mom. She's going through really, really traumatic circumstances, and she is scared to death about what's going to happen to her kids and for good reason. And I have to say, I deal with moms through a couple of uh, organizations and forums and so forth that I'm part of. I deal with moms every week of my life whose children are no longer speaking to them because the domestic violence perpetrator just churned those kids against her. And I'm not saying that every time kids turn against their mom, it's because of a domestic violence perpetrator. I'm just saying those are the cases that I'm dealing with, he's the reason that happened. And, and so when she's scared, during litigation, like she's got a lot to be scared about. Um, she's dealing with really extreme circumstances and she is almost never overreacting. Once in a while, I look at the evidence, I really look carefully into a case and still come to the conclusion that she's overreacting. It's so unusual, it's so unusual. The notion that she's overreacting tends to completely break down once you carefully investigate the case. And she's going to tell you stories about things that judges did and the guardians ad litem did and the parent coordinators did where you're going to think, well, this can't be true. They wouldn't do those things. Oh, yes, they do. I, I specialize in investigating these cases. And my most recent book, which is called In Custody, uh, I discuss in that book, it's a, it's a novel, but I actually go into real life cases with the real names in, in custody. Uh, the, the main character in In Custody is a journalist, and she finds a bunch of these real life cases that I then discuss in the book, where they'll describe a whole set of things that family courts did in a whole bunch of different situations where you won't even be able to believe that this is real, that these are cases that are right from the newspaper. <laughs> They're actually all cases where the abuser eventually killed the children, or, it, or at least killed at least one of the children. And, and the family court, it, it was like all the evidence was there. So you got to believe what she's telling you, even if it sounds really extreme and wacko about what the court is doing, unless you have really, really strong evidence that, that that's not true. So, so I'm going to stop there so we can have the rest of the time for, for uh, questions. Hey, Lundy, thank you. That was great. We've got some really good questions. Um, before we do that, can you tell me, tell, I'm going to type it in here, but what's the name of the, who's the um, book, the psychological evidence? Uh, here, let me go back to my screen for just a second. And uh, there it is. Coping with Psychiatric and Psychological Testimony by Jay Ziskin. And uh, these are these are all these. Oh, the, the, the John E.B. Myers Law Guide is terrific. All, that's for lawyers also. The Evidence in Child Abuse and Neglect Cases by John E.B. Myers is terrific. Yeah, I have that. I do have that link. So I'm going to definitely put that link in my, uh, I'll get that link in the chat in a minute. Okay. So, okay. Um, great. Thank you so much. We've got a lot of questions here. Um, I 
yes, I'm sending the CLE information. I've got to actually um, print out all those certificates, everyone. So that'll be coming in a few days. Um, people, have, people have their feedback form now, Vicki, because you wanted to make sure. That oh, I did want to do that. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, hmm, let me do it this way. I'll pull that up first. Thank you for the reminder. You're welcome. Ha. Here we go. Let me open that up. All right. Um, I am now going to share my, let me make this big. I'm going to share my screen. Sorry, guys. Um, I can quickly answer a question as you look in the-, the, uh, the Yeah, I don't know why. You know what I'm gonna do? I, it's right. Here it is. I just need to move the questions over to the side. And then you can use the QR code or cut and paste that link at the bottom. I also put the link into the chat in a second. Um, Here's some things about um, how to best handle the situation when you have an order protection in court and you've filed a divorce as well, um, which is something that we often have happen. Um, so then the OP moves over to the domestic relations court. Um, the, any suggestions on how to best approach, you know, the, the children and parents, the children and parents? And, I'm, not yeah. sure, I'm not sure I'm entirely understanding the question, but the, but because the domestic relations court is going to be taking over the question of protective order, there's there's just a need to, to try to help them understand and persuade persuade them to understand why the, the it is relevant to have the children protected by the order also and not just the mom. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure if the question is asking me something other than that. Yeah, well, we'll find out. Um, the, we also have... Here, this is great. Thank you, Lisa. Um, she said, I know this exact situation. Children have been placed with dad full time. I feel helpless because the judge is falling for dad's charm, has the kids and the court convinced that mom is an alcoholic. All the kids now hate mom. This could be a, any Shelva case. <laughs> Where can we get actual data to show the court? Um, so you want to maybe talk about some of those studies that can be brought into evidence. You mentioned it, and I, I did put the Saunders study link in there as well. Um, and we and we and oh, and we had talked about making sure that, to draw people's attention to the ACE study, yeah. the Childhood Experiences study also. The so so my professional book, which is very expensive, but you can get it at a library, so you don't have to pay for it, is, which is called The Batterer as Parent. That that has you know something like over 300 citations in it and just so many different studies on so many different points and the i don't think it would make sense for me now to take the time to try to point you to specific things in that in that book you can and by the way the modern library will get you if they don't own a book they will get you any book you request within about four or five days i mean it's amazing how libraries work nowadays and the interlibrary loan has just become like a whole industry it's incredible and the, the, that way you can go to the subject that you're looking at, which is might be the overlap between batters and child physical abuse or the overlap between batters and child sexual abuse or the issues about children deteriorating once they're in unsupervised visitation, you can look to the particular issue and then you'll be able to see the studies or citations to back it up. Yeah, yeah, it's really about knowing the evidence. And I, I think that's a really important point um, is that as attorneys, you know, you talked a lot about what kind of attorney the client should be looking for. And I think we talked about this ourselves, you know, between yesterday, just that even if the client, the attorney needs to be willing to look at these studies and understand these studies and bring these studies into evidence. Yeah. Um, and you don't have to be a bulldog to do that. You just need to, you have to be willing to learn. And um, Shalva is here to help. Other agencies are here to help. I know there's some people from Lifespan on, I believe Prairie State Legal Services. Um, there's lots of places where if you, if an attorney is representing a client in this situation, they don't know what to do. There are plenty of places to go and get help um, and, and learn 
and just you got it's just stuff that you've got to learn. And I really, I really encourage the concept of actually handing in studies with your paperwork up for certain hearings or for, or for, for uh, you know, the, or if, uh, for trials or whatever there are times when it's really relevant to actually hand the study in with your paperwork. Uh, the, the, another point I want to make is that I find over and over again that people who are in the field aren't recognizing how other people in their same field are handling cases. And so I, for example, this was a long time ago, but, but back when I lived in the Boston area, a judge became one of my good friends. And she wasn't a family law judge, she was a criminal law judge. But uh, we, we started to hang out together socially. And I remember her, uh, Judge Hanlon saying to me about certain things that I told her, oh, Lundy, no judge would do that. And I would have to say, uh, Judge Hanlon, I've been in court as many times as judges did this. So, uh, so GALs will tend to say, oh, GALs wouldn't do this. Judges will tend to say judges wouldn't do this. Judges will tend to say GALs wouldn't do this. I encourage you to look a little deeper because it's just the, the, they're just case after case after case where the research is not being looked at, the implications are not being looked at. Maybe people are taking domestic violence seriously in the abstract, but they're not looking at, well, what do we actually know about what that means for kids? And I really encourage people at risk of being self-promoting to go to the batterer as parent. I really would love everybody in the legal system to have read that book. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I, you talked about this a little bit, but I want to just bring it up again. Um, and there was a question. I, well, I'm going to go with this one first. Do you have any advice about helping clients process that it's just not fair? We get a lot. We get a lot of that too. Thank you, Courtney, for bringing that up. It, it just, it's how to deal with just what feels like the unfairness of the situation. So. The first thing is that I find is that when people are responding to her, to, to her experience of unfairness, they tend to try to skip past it too quickly and say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. So the first thing I would say is don't skip past it so quickly. Be, be, be willing, be able first to just sit with her for a few minutes saying, yes, it's really unfair. It's really inappropriate. The system is not thinking well about what's good for kids. The, the we're with you and so take a minute and just be there so that so that she feels like you got it <laughs> then you might say the next things which could be things like where where to start exploring with her where where is your agency you know, you know how in, in the sense of you know how can you be an agent like wh how can you work on your relationships with your children how can you get your children so that they have into more support services so there's more for them uh, is it time to think about a different attorney? All those kinds of questions, but just, and, and those are all good questions. Just don't, just don't go there quite so fast. She really needs people to be able to just be with her and, and she needs to feel like you're taking in what she's telling you. And people have a hard time doing that. People have a hard time accepting the reality of what's really going on in the family law system. Thank you. Okay, here's another good one. Does an abused woman have a better chance of getting primary custody with the argument of already acting as a primary parent instead of the DV argument? So if a husband wants 50-50 custody, even though he has not done 50% of the parenting thus far. So that kind of primary parent attachment. So I, so I have to answer this question very cautiously. I can talk about it in generalities and in generalities, like not respect to your particular court, your particular judge, your particular attorney. In generalities, the answer is yes, that it's actually better to argue the case on other bases, bases than on the domestic violence basis because courts are not responding well to domestic violence allegations. In fact, very interesting study, which I refer to in the batter as parent, a study that looked at custody evaluators, custody evaluations, and found that on average, custody evaluators recommend more time for dad in cases where mom reports a history of domestic violence than in cases where mom does not report a history of domestic violence. Now, you may think that I just misspoke. It's like, oh, no, Lundy, you meant to say, it's like, no, I meant to say what I just said, that this study, it's cited in the batter's parents, good study, found that custody evaluators recommend more time for dad in domestic violence cases than in non-domestic violence cases. Why? Well, I can tell you because I used to be a custody evaluator. The, 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 and, the, and the culture has gotten worse because I haven't been a custody evaluator for over 15 years now. The culture among custody evaluators has gotten much worse than it was then. 
the, the belief is, well, if mom is reporting a history of domestic violence, that means that she's out, that she's doing that because she's out to, to damage kids' relationship with their father. So we need to recommend extra time for him to try to compensate for the fact that mom is the, is the type who would accuse this lovely, sweet, enjoyable man of domestic violence, which also points to this whole class and race prejudice there is about domestic violence. The assumption that a domestic violence perpetrator would be some kind of uneducated, uh, poorly spoken, nasty, low income, and probably man of color man. When the statistics tell us he's just as likely to be white, college, educated, advanced degree, top dog, slick, it, you know, he's just as likely to be a batter. The research shows, the research shows very precisely, just as likely to be a batter. Uh, so the, the, you know, this atmosphere of all this misconception is a really, is a, is a really, really big factor. I lost my train of thought. I don't know, was I at the end of my, have I answered that question or did I not quite? I get think that? you did. I okay. think you did. Talk, yeah, talking about how unfortunately, um, I think the start was the bet, that you're better off not even bringing the DV up, unfortunately, but, and then talking a little bit about the parental alienation as well. Really better to argue it on other bases if you can. Yeah, which is a horrible, horrible and talk about fairness and unfairness and trying to explain to your client who just wants things to be fair. Why it is that we're not bringing up the domestic violence um, that that she's endured for so many years? Um, I, I know we're running out of time, so I'm just going to do a, I can do a couple more. If, if, so if, many if, questions. OK, so I think this one is important, too. Um, I provide supervised parenting services and I'm concerned about court ordered supervised parenting time with small traumatized children. Even with a playful environment, we have difficulty. So that's talk about supervised parenting with the abuser. Um, any thoughts on how we can avoid re-traumatizing these children? Ugh. The, the, you know, the visitation supervisor, the, first of all, I appreciate that you're tuned into this, mm -hmm. whoever is asking the question. And the, the, the supervised visitation center can make additional rules if it wants to about how the visits to take place. But I think what you're talking about, I assume what you're talking about is a case where really just the fact that the child is even having to be there. It's just like the, the child needs some healing time before they're even ready for supervised contact with this person. Uh, the supervised visitation center can sometimes do some educating of the courts. And I think that's probably what I would most recommend is that in, when you write reports for the court to try to say, you know, we're seeing signs that, 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 this child is not really ready yet, and then maybe you can point the court to some studies that might help you help you understand children's trauma. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Um, okay, someone asked about getting the studies. I think we talked about that. This is another good one. In our community, we have spoken about getting DV experts into family court. So like, you know, kind of that specialized advocate. Are you aware of any training that is available that will have judges accepting and acknowledging this expertise in the family courts? Are there any, or who would you, I, the question is, it would be great to get DV experts into, into our domestic relations court system. Um, are there any trainings or any anything that we could recommend like to present to the judges um, to have them understand that this is something that they need? Oh, well, I would go to the, I, I would go to the, um, uh, well, I guess for the, the great source of training is the London Family Court Clinic, if it still exists. And then the, the, the which is in London, Ontario in Canada. And then and then the, um, what are they called? The, the juvenile and the Association of Juvenile and Family Court Judges or something like that. Right. They, have, they have some really good stuff on domestic, for judges on domestic violence and for other they court do. personnel on domestic violence. That's do. not, I don't think I have the name right of that. Is, it, is that the Battered Women's Justice Project? Is that part of that? No, that's separate. No, this is, because this is actually a judicial organization. It's the, it's the- I'm picturing the woman who ran who ran it and I can't think of her name. I'm gonna get Esther, I'm gonna get you that information. We're gonna we're gonna okay, we can, we'll, yeah. we'll we'll track we'll track that down. It, it's we a name I refer it. to all the time that for some mysterious reason I'm blanking on today. Um, okay and I think one last question. Okay, being aware that children being exposed to DV abuses is not ideal even when the children haven't yet been abused. Well we can question 
of whether or not they really have been abused, because I would say that they have, and I think Lundy would as well. What's the alternative when both parents are entitled to rights? Should attorneys be advocating for completely cutting off contact with the other parent when that is just not likely to happen by the court except in extreme cases? What no. is the ideal ask when supervision is often seen as a temporary solution? What we want to ask for is for the court to use a meaningful set of measures for whether he has dealt with his issues. So for example, if someone's on supervised visitation because of a mental health problem, the court's going to want two things. It's going to want evidence that you're in the right service, some kind of appropriate psychotherapy and maybe medication. And they're going to want indications that the symptoms are abating. Those same two things are going to be true for all kinds of other things. If you're, if you're on supervised visitation because of alcoholism, they're going to want to know, are you in proper alcohol treatment and have you stopped drinking? If you're on supervised visitation because of incompetent, or reckless, dangerous parenting, they're going to want to know, are you in the right service, which would be parent education, and two, is your parenting actually improving? If you're on supervised visitation because of domestic violence perpetration, the court says, well, how's he doing in supervised visitation? So like, it doesn't follow the pattern of the other three. There's no like, well, is he in the right service? And are there signs that he's overcoming his abusiveness? Is his behavior improving? So why is there a completely different approach to when you're, when you're on supervised visitation for any other reason, why do you demand these two things, but you don't demand either of these two things if he's on supervised visitation because of a history of domestic violence perpetration? So he should have to be in a high quality batter intervention program for at least a year. And there should be signs that he's actually overcoming his abusiveness. In other words, he's starting to talk and think differently about the mother. He's starting to accept responsibility for the damage he did to the kids. And he's starting to give up using the children as weapons against her. So the approach that we want to take in court is to say, no, we want him involved. We want these children to have a father. We want proper steps in place to keep these children safe until he deals with his issues. And then we want a proper measure put in place of whether he's dealt with his issues or not, as we start to move towards unsupervised short bits of unsupervised contact, and then maybe ideally someday longer chunks of unsupervised contact. And again, in the batterer's parent, and sorry about that, I don't like to promote my own books, but there just aren't other, there's just not similar resources out there. There's a whole chapter on how you assess change in a domestic abuse perpetrator in, in his issues in general, and with respect to parenting, those overlap very tightly. So that we can say to the court, look, we're not, it says right here, we should be seeing this and we're not seeing any of these things. And yet you're wanting to switch him to unsupervised content. Right, that's huge. Okay, Diane Rosenfeld, thank you so much. She, it's the NCJSJ. National Council, thank you. It's the National Council of Jewish Family Court Judges. That yes. It was the first Thank word. You. It's a mouthful. It's a mouthful. Um, and it looks like Joanna got it too. Thank you. Anyone who gets it gets a gold star for the day. I'll give you an extra 15 minutes of CLE for getting that out. I'm just kidding. I can't do that. But thank you so much. Um, I am going to put, I am going to put the survey thing. Um, I think I'm, I'm pasting it back. In, and nope, that wasn't it. Um, please remember to fill out the survey. It's there in the chat. Um, I think that it, this has been so wonderful again today. We did not yet again get to answer all of your questions, but I have them saved. And I think that we will be doing a series. I, I already have this in my head. We're, I'm, you're not finished with us yet because I'm going to have a series of um, questions for you that you're going to have to answer and we'll turn those into emails or blog posts for you. So please do not forget to do the survey. Um, I can share. Oh gosh, it was so hard to share my screen. Just fill out the survey. I'm going to send you an email link after this with asking you to do the survey as well. Oh, somebody's asking me to reshare the survey. Hang on. I'm, I'm going to have to run, but thanks so much, yes. everybody. Great Please meeting. go.